Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you for making it a priority, especially on a Friday afternoon in the busy holiday season, to join us today to learn about an exciting opportunity for expanding systems of care upon strong pillars of long-term sustainability. Late December is often a time of nostalgia as people tend to reflect on the year behind us. While there is great value in reflection, we hope today's webinar will match the predominant motivation of care champions to visualize a better future for young people facing difficult circumstances in their families, and importantly, to, draw, to develop a roadmap to guide us from the last days of 2015 toward that dream-worthy tomorrow. Your presence with us today is your initial response to an invitation of four national-level partners. The Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health has provided today's forum to inform you as state and community leaders about the best and brightest opportunities to drive this national movement forward as best suits where you work and live. I'm Frank Ryder representing the American Institutes for Research. AIR is one of the world's largest behavioral and social science research and evaluation organizations. AIR will celebrate its 70th birthday in 2016, and our Center for Public-Private Partnerships hopes some of you will join us as our respective missions align in the coming year. We hope to share with you the unique pleasure of working with the open table at once a very humble organization that is helping community after community to harness the mighty power of discipleship to heal the wounds of human isolation that can keep people stuck when a life just like anyone else's can be within their reach. And all of this can be possible because on the national, of the national leadership of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which for nearly 20 years has mastered the challenge of making strategic investments of very limited resources to be a catalyst for positive mental health and individual futures that are not insulted and derailed by mental health challenges. You can see that we've got a lot of ground to cover with you today in a short one-hour webinar. Today's presentation is designed to introduce you to a practice model, the open table, that has already transformed hundreds of individual lives through relationship from the deserts of Arizona to the eastern shores of Maryland. You'll discover an imaginative new pathway available to help your systems of care to progress from demonstrating innovative agency cooperation to fully penetrating the fabric of communities. And we will tell you what steps you can take to join this movement. To begin, it's my pleasure to introduce our friend, Dr. Gary Blau, Chief of the Child, Adolescent, and Family Branch of the Center for Mental Health Services. Gary? Great. Thank you very much, Frank. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes, thank goodness. OK. Well, and thanks to all of you who joined the call today. Uh, echo Frank's sentiments about this Friday and during the holiday season and everything. Um, I get a few minutes of welcome mostly to encourage you to participate and send in an application to become part of this amazing process. So let me sort of step back and say that a couple of years ago, I had really wanted to get involved with faith-based uh, organizations in terms of our relationship with systems of care. And it seems so natural that you know, systems of care is really developing these coordinated networks of providers and entities and agencies, et cetera. And why should we not, you know, uh, in, invest in getting involved with, say, businesses and recreational activities and faith-based organizations? And that's where I got um, turned on to Open Table and John Katov uh, and his team, who you'll be hearing a lot from in terms of their work that has really started with advancing their aims of reducing poverty and, you know, and improving the well-being of people who uh, have been enrolled in churches. And you're going to hear about how they've transformed ideas within church and now synagogues um, and other settings uh, to say that si simply 
you know, doing charity work is great and it's wonderful, but what about people that want to create this table, for an, an open table of people who, who can help individuals on their journeys? And, uh, and so they really began to connect with us and we saw that this kind of an investment between systems of care and you know, faith-based organizations would prove to be remarkable in the way that we can help our young people who have serious mental health challenges and their families, et cetera. So Open Table, uh, we started to have these conversations about all of this and to talk about how, how does this work in terms of spiritual or attracting people of faith to serve uh, as part of these tables, which really are, in essence, wraparound teams. This is about going in and having a, a, a faith-based organization try to find a way to create a wraparound team, and it's not clinical or anything like that because, you know, we have our systems of care, what's going on. So often it's an adjunct to this, or even at times it's been a handoff where, where our work can be done, but there's a longer-term trajectory. And who can stay involved in that length of time with, you know, a person's life? Well, certainly it's not going to be necessarily providers or, you know, institutions like the government, but it can be faith-based organizations. And, and so we began to come up with strategies. We, we started talking about this connection. Uh, we had Open Table join us at one of our training institutes and talking to other people. And we then came up with this idea about having an application process where a team or group of, you know, of, of our grantee communities could literally apply, very easily by the way, to become a pilot project for systems of care and open table connectedness and connections. And, and so we started to think, all right, if we have these varying groups that are going to be uh, our pilots, how will that work and what can we do to support them? Well, number one, is that we expect a small commitment you know, from the local community, the local grantee, to get involved because everybody's got to have a dog in, you know, in the fight here and we're all playing together. What SAMHSA does is that we provide support and technical assistance. We've created opportunities for online training curriculums. Um, we've done uh, the uh, other kinds of training ideas and webinars and, and connected the dots here across what's happening. And then we got so we, we did all this sort of roles and responsibilities, and lo and behold, we had three communities, I guess it was over a year ago, come to the forefront of what we were trying to accomplish. One in Orlando, Florida, um, with our grantee there. One in Saginaw, Michigan, our grantee there. And then another and our third in Chautauqua County, New York. And I have to, sell, to share with folks that the pilots have worked out even better than I first anticipated. The, the, um, the mayor of Orlando, for example, has taken this approach and wants to expand and extend that. Um, I'm hoping at some point folks will watch uh, the video that Saginaw has done and the work that's been occurring in Chautauqua about their, how all of these faith-based organizations have come together under this purpose and it's ultimately to help the children, the youth, and families that we serve. So again, our approach to this has been that we are interested in taking um, the opportunity for our grantees and with, with a grantee commitment and desire to engage with the faith-based organizations that we can bring the open table concept to the table and all of the resources that they have. And, and I have to say that um, I, I am proud to call John Katov a friend, a colleague, and, and a mentor of, about how to do this. He has literally been on site at, these, at, these play, at our pilot projects, helping people to learn how to do this model, helping people to engage with um, the brothers and sisters uh, within their congregations, and ultimately making open table and systems of care an effective and partnership strategy to improve lives, and it has really worked. So all of that is said that I am so hopeful that we will get some additional um, grantees that want to go into the space of public-private partnerships. Um, we are blessed as well to have our colleagues from the American Institutes for Research, from the Technical Assistance Network at, through the University of Maryland, as well as some other partners that are continuing to provide guidance and, and 
um, and support to John and Open Table, like John Vandenberg, who really has been, um, you know, of course, the guru of wraparound and how all of this connects. So, uh, and, and Frank Ryder, of course. So, what we have seen um, from this process is a transformation and an ability for the government to work with our providers, our grantees, and our faith-based organizations to truly make a difference. So I hope that you'll consider you know, sending in an application and participating with us on this next iteration of the model. We have lessons learned. You'll hear more about that, um, and we continue to want to do that. So thanks for letting me share this. Um, thanks for your interest. I hope that you'll consider joining us in this venture. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Frank. Thank you, Gary, especially for your inspiration and endorsement, your investments, and your reinforcement. So as a financing and sustainability specialist, I'm particularly aware of the many challenges that system of care leaders face when you're trying to nurture initiatives from exciting projects into something that irreversibly transforms as an incubator of opportunity for people. All we have to think about is the roller coaster ride of the past eight years to understand how major economic and social forces and political dysfunction can threaten great visions with unreliable funding and shifting winds. At the individual and family level, even most of our best services often close up shop at 5 p.m. every day, reopening their doors on Monday mornings and hoping that clients have managed to survive long enough for their next dosage of treatment. That is, so long as there are still more units of service authorized within the limitations of service budgets and program rules. Social workers at Casey Family Programs who work with young adults coming out of foster care in Phoenix have described this in terms of expiration dates for professional services. While complex and often chronic human challenges persist without interruption. So even the best treatment services are typically designed to address a specific symptom or diagnosis, but very few recognize and address root causes or even actively address real barriers in people's lives that limit the impact of those treatments, like poverty, discrimination, hopelessness, and damaged self-concept. And success in services is often rewarded with a termination of those services instead of with customized reinforcement and extended support. Ironically, tremendous opportunity rests within the membership of every American community. But formal service systems admit one of their biggest limitations is an inability to tap into that reservoir of informal, natural support that could effectively multiply human service budgets many times over. Systems of care at their core values and principles have long recognized the primary value of harnessing individual motivation through voice and choice and culturally sensitive and responsive approaches. But methods to bring those values to actual individual experience remain limited. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we could somehow apply the lessons that we've learned in demonstration after demonstration to reach into the almost untapped social capital of our communities? And wouldn't it be especially amazing if we could figure out how to do that in a way that could invite literally millions of favorably predisposed fellow travelers who are just waiting for an invitation and a way to become part of the solution? Well, we can. We can, within our communities, create an evidence-based, replicable method of tapping into the enormous assets of faith communities in legitimate and effective partnerships with government to support our impoverished brothers and sisters, including those whose struggles we know so well through their involvement with our child-serving programs. So how large a reservoir are we talking about? About half of all Americans actively participate in faith communities. Across more than 300,000 congregations of every shape and size, stands an incredibly diverse and willing pool of well over 100 million people across our land who are choosing to commit themselves as disciples of a power greater than themselves to put their beliefs and faith and moral values into action on behalf of their fellow man, woman, and child. Incredibly, more than 90% of those congregations have already chosen 
to participate in human service efforts, mostly with no public financial support of any kind. This vast reservoir of individuals, each with family, friends, employers, connections, skills, and resources, are present in every single community today, many simply awaiting an invitation or to know how they can act and what they can do. It is my pleasure to introduce John Katov, the founder and CEO of The Open Table. John? All right, thank you so much. I, um, I guess the first thing I'd like to talk about are the critical factors that you should consider as you develop a faith-based um, initiative. And there are four I'd like to focus on. <clears throat> the first factor is that faith communities across the country are moving from an internal focus to an external focus. This means congregations and their millions of members are becoming community focused. Faith communities are re-examining the, re the impact of transactional support for people in poverty, like used clothes, and looking to participate in ways that can support the transformation of people in need. The second factor is that faith communities have some of the largest untapped storehouses of intellectual and social capital and community, and community connections in the nation that can be invested in people in, transaction, in, in, uh, transaction, in, in transition. Through their servant mission, congregations are able to provide long-term relationships and a community of support to people transitioning outside of poverty that does not have an expiration date. <clears throat> the third factor is that faith communities are looking for new ways to engage in transformational initiatives. They want to connect their congregations to initiatives that teach members how to support the transformation of people in need. They want their members to live into their faith purpose. <clears throat> the fourth factor is that faith communities want the knowledge, experience, and expertise of government to be able to practice transformation effectively. They approach this transformational work as learners and partners in a shared purpose with systems of care. All that is needed is a model that can, be, that can bring faith and government together in a shared purpose. Faith communities and system of care in a, a breakthrough model for collaboration and community transformation are proving that a shared purpose through the open table model um, can work. Open table started because of one relationship with one man in poverty. Uh, my church had a mission down to a shelter in town. For 18 months, we, we tested the proposition that 38 grams of fiber in the energy bars that we handed out would transform poverty. To our surprise, it didn't. At the end of this mission, after handing out all these energy bars, a man came around the tables where we were um, distributing them and asked if he could worship at our church. A friend and I brought him up to our congregation. We worshiped together. Our congregation fell in love with him. But I think that the turning point, what, what was the catalyst for Open Table and the realization um, of the power that faith and government can have in transformation is that I realized that this man, uh, his name is Ernie, was falling in love with me. I never planned on a man from a shelter who I was handing energy bars out to would be able to change my life in that way. And I think our congregation realized that we all needed to have our lives changed in that way. And that through mutual relationship, through reciprocal relationship with our sisters and brothers in poverty, um, we can walk together. Of course, we learned one other thing, is that we had thousands of years of intellectual and social capital and community connections, thousands of them, that we hoarded in our congregation. When Ernie showed up, asking for transformation, the best we could do was our used clothes. But we knew that the intellectual and social capital that we had is what made our lives. And so we decided to try and find a way to invest what helped us in Ernie's own plan for his own life. Um, we were businessmen at the time. We formed a board of directors like any good business was. Um, Ernie was game to meet with his board. Um, the short story is that we met for eight, that we met for eight months we worked together on uh, health care, budgeting, employment. We changed each other. We fell in love with each other. At the end of eight months, when Ernie was sustainable in the community, 
He fired us. He told us that he was sick and tired of us being in his business. He could do this on his own. And though we felt kind of sad, we also learned that that is the journey that we can take to each other, that we can form relationship, we can help each other develop an independent life. My relationship with Ernie has lasted for 10 years now. All of our relationships last beyond the length of, of, of the table and of the science around this model. And that really is the vision, long-term establishing supportive relationships in a community that never run out, that draw on the intellectual and social capital that are resources without end to support each other and, and change each other. I'm going to ask Judith Rich, our National Executive Director, um, to talk about how the model works and its structure. Judith? Thank you, John. Um, the open table model starts first with building relationships. Um, volunteers commit to meet for one year for weekly meetings, and the tables are comprised between six and twelve volunteers based on the candidate that they um, that they are serving. The model that you're looking at um, on the presentation is what we would call our family model, and it is um, based on individuals who have children that they are responsible for on a daily basis. Um, the individuals that we serve are called brothers and sisters. Open table is not a clinical model, so we, we don't refer to them as clients. Um, brothers and sisters are the only one at the table who have veto power. Everyone else operates under a consensus model, um, which is very similar to a wraparound voice and choice. An open table journey is a voluntary association for both the table members and for the brother or sister. And um, the thing that's really most important for you to understand is that congregation members are not experts in any of these fields that these chairs are, are labeled as. They're just willing to track issues related to that particular item and then resource that as necessary. Um, they represent, those, those titles um, on the chairs represent many of the issues that people in poverty confront. And as table members track those issues related to those particular issues that come up during conversations around the table, then they resource within either their congregation or their community for expertise as needed. Um, the young adult version of the open table model was developed in collaboration with Casey Family Programs, the Arizona State Office, and a couple of other independent living providers that serve youth aged 18 to 24. The difference in this version is actually the reduced number of table members at the table, trying to minimize some of the um, frustration or uh, insecurity of a young adult. Um, the intentional invitation to a natural support is um, something that comes at the request of the brother or sister. They have the option of inviting someone in. The other chairs that are in that little gray box to the left of the table are not actually part of the table decision-making process, but they come and provide, at the request of the brother or sister, um, their input and uh, resources. So the secret sauce um, is actually the, the process of reciprocal sharing between the brothers and sisters. Um, the brother and sister is always the decision maker about their plans. Um, the model is driven by relationship, but it's built at table meetings and then during social interactions. Keep in mind, they're meeting once a week for an hour for a year. That's a significant amount of time, but they're focused on work. Um, then they do social activities outside of the meetings. The relationship is absolutely foundational to building an environment of trust. So through congregations, networking, um, tables have been able to access resources such as accounting help or tax uh, issues, um, auto mechanics, behavioral health counseling when they were not yet approved for another, um, another service, career mentoring, actually being able to go into an employer and, and job shadow to see if that's something that they're interested in. Child care, when their child care resources are, are not available or if there is a, a sick child. Dentistry and, and medical help, bringing an expert to them to help advocate for them with a, a physician possibly in another system. Education advice, housing, furniture, um, for example, you know, jobs, being able to you know, talk them through the interview process. And then attorneys, 
um, all of these people may not sit at the table, but most congregations have people that they either engaged in pers with personally in these areas or, um, or know of experts that have that. Um, a table member in Iowa shared with us that we wanted to work with a young with a youth aging out of the system. Our first table was with a boy who had been in foster care and was coming out of prison. We carried many preconceived notions of what people in prison would be like. When we met him, we were so surprised at how open and honest he was with us. He had made bad choices, served his time, and was ready to start again. He was motivated. We had to learn to see him as a new man, not a man with a history. He's now a welder. He is engaged with, to a great girl, and he doesn't take any social services. He has embraced us as his extended family. Um, another table member in Southfield, Arizona, shared that um, with 10 people on a table, we collectively know almost everyone in the congregation and what resources they are. The congregation members always offer their skills for whatever contribution is needed, and we also use third parties, people not in the congregation, whom we knew from our background. These are examples of actual table members that have shared their experience. I'm going to um, send this back now to John to share a little bit more about our um, technical support. Thank you, Judith. Open Table has developed um, a very in-depth suite of technical support tools to launch our tables. And rather than um, taking you through them, um, I invite you to, to um, call Saginaw Max, um, Wraparound Orge in Orlando, um, or Tapestry in Chautauqua and ask about the level of technical support um, and the, the expertise in launching tables and helping to bring faith in government um, around this initiative. Um, I, we have a very strong presentation of support um, to move these initiatives forward. But the other thing I'd like to say, too, is that the open table, um, the process and the model, um, has significant contributions from the organizations on this call today. Um, as well as the systems themselves. Um, when we arrived in these three systems, um, and now where we, are, wh where we are a year later, we have a much higher level um, of technical support and understanding about how to implement the model. I'm with the Saginaw team today um, in Saginaw, Michigan, and um, they are now stakeholders in this model. As you look into it more, you will see that this is truly becoming a shared purpose, faith, system of care model. Um, and we ask you to, and we, we invite you to join us and, and help raise the level of expertise around it. Open Table now um, is being implemented in uh, more than 20 states. You can see a list of the populations that the model is serving. That list continues to increase. The common characteristic in all of them is a poverty um, experiencing poverty and experiencing the poverty of relationship. By bringing relationship around people, we help strengthen them and sink roots in the community. Um, John Vandenberg, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you so much for your um, ongoing encouragement and uh, role in Open Table. Uh, thanks, John. Um, Hey everybody, I'm, I'm glad to talk with you today. I probably have met many of you on the call and thanks for doing this with us all. Um, just want to stress that wraparound and open table are, are absolutely very, very similar, although, and it's important to say, they were developed independently. Um, I first heard about open table about five years ago when a wraparound colleague said, hey, I just heard about this thing and it, boy, it sounds cool. And um, I got in touch with Open Table, began to collaborate with Open Table, and very shortly realized that something a lot of us in system of care had spent years trying to do was to have a viable connection to the faith community. Why? That's where the natural supports often are. That's where the if families have lost their own natural supports, that's where surrogates are. That's where intellectual capital is. And we. I, I very quickly found that Open Table really was uh, something that I wanted to be involved with, and I've spent the last four and a half years uh, volunteering my time um, uh, to to Open Table as uh, as part of my uh, retirement years, as they say. So 
we have a chart here in front of you that just talks about similarities between the two models. I'm not going to go through each bullet of this, but just to say lots of similarities, individualization, strength-based focus, unconditional care, uh, absolutely focused on support. At the heart of the similarities is that voice and choice of the brother and sister being driven by in an open table calls you know, consumers or the, 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 the key object of open table calls them brothers and sisters. But the brothers and sisters really drive the process. There are some differences. The differences such as in wraparound, we all, always had a, um, a, a, a group formed with the family identified first. An open table, uh, tables come together and form and get ready to go, and then a brother or sister is brought to that table. But these differences are, are really minor in comparison. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just if you look at the chart in front of you, we, we have some families that really start wraparound and then move into a transition to a long-term relationship and sustainability. Um, who, who, have a, who have the ability to say, OK, we really got this critical support, clinical help, uh, support through the system of care, um, really helped stabilize our family. But we may need really long-term support in order to move forward, and particularly for those families that are living in poverty. So there's an intersection between system of care and open table. Now, there are families that may start open table without being part of systems of care that later need to intersect with wraparound. So it's not a totally linear process, as you see in this slide. I want to talk just a little bit about the research base uh, and the evaluative base for open table. Um, open table you know, is a grassroots level, as John uh, said earlier, started from you know, one guy, one church in Phoenix, Arizona but has now gone uh, really national and lots of interest uh, around the planet in the model. But didn't start with a huge government grant. Just started with one guy and one church. So we didn't have a giant research base. But now the research base is really being backloaded. And as you'll see, we're really doing this march towards being, having the essential elements of a promising practice. Um, the first thing I would say is that wraparound and open table are so similar that we really believe, and social scientists that have looked at this believe, that much of the wraparound evidence base, which of course, as people know, is very extensive now, really applies to open table. Research on individualization and voice and choice and, and support-oriented practice. Um, but in addition, we've had some more recent and uh, studies that are influential I just want to very quickly mention. Uh, Phoenix did a return on investment study uh, several years back that really said, hey, this is a small amount of investment to produce a massive amount of dollars worth of, of, of social capital out of the churches and the volunteer time. Recently, we did a study of all the 2013 program graduates a year plus after they had graduated. And what we found was that, and this, is, uh, this study is listed on the Open Table website should you want to see it, we looked at you know, are the principles of Open Table in place? Are those core elements of the process in place? Such as, we know Open Table is about relationship. We know that you deal with poverty through a one-on-one -on -one relationship of that table and the person in poverty. Does the brother and sister really feel like that happened for them? And the answer was yes. We also have a, uh, in, in progress right now, is a very interesting qualitative study by, uh, by AIR uh, that looked at interviewing brothers and sisters in Phoenix and other places, and really looking for what are the indicators that this is really changing the life of this brother and sister? What are the indicators that it's changing the life of the community as well? Um, more recently, in the system of care world, uh, AIR is piloting a survey tool that looks at uh, brothers and sisters' gains in the, in the three uh, system of care sites right now. We've got some future research that we've begun already, uh, really looking at things like discipleship and looking at uh, you know, how, how does a group of people come together and change how they view the world and how they view poverty. We think that 
We think that every brother and sister that graduates Open Table touches many, many, many other people in the community, their own family, their their friends, uh, their their natural supports. We think that uh, the, the that we really should be researching that, and we've actually begun that process of doing that. So, lots of excitement as this moves into promising practice mode. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn this uh, back over to Frank. Frank, go ahead. Thank you, John. So we know that two heads are better than one and that it takes a team of many players with complementary capacities and skills in order to succeed, whether we're talking about team sports, successful businesses, well-functioning families, or well-functioning American and human communities. The open table opportunity for systems of care is no exception. You can see the multifaceted partnership that we're presenting to you today faith communities and the reservoir of social and incremental capital that they represent, a dynamic and proven method supported by an effective lean and mean incubator organization, the Open Table, vision, leadership, and strategic resource investments by SAMHSA, and more importantly, by your community child and family serving systems, technical expertise, and the capacities of backbone organizations like the TA Network, and AIR Center for Public-Private Partnerships to enable development of this ubiquitous, untapped resource in the unique ways and at the specific pace to be viable in every community. In particular, let's take a look at your role as leaders of systems of care. All of these are described in more detail in the RFP materials that will be available to you at the end of today's webinar. We're talking about taking skills you have already developed and refined as system of care leaders in generating productive win-win partnerships among previously distinct service systems and now learning how to apply them to the new context of partnership with congregations and faith-based institutions in your community. So in general, these are tasks that you're already familiar with. The current opportunity can bring the new expertise that you'll need to learn how to apply those same skills to this new context. Now, we've already worked together to develop the means to do this. Gary talked about the initial pilots. Just about a year ago, the TA Network hosted a similar webinar to today's, which also featured the same charge and endorsement that you heard from Gary Blau and SAMHSA at the beginning of the hour. The Open Table and AIR provided a similar explanation and invitation as we're doing today. The very first Open Table in Systems of Care pilot was launched that day. And the first three community of Systems of Care were selected from the ensuing applicants to pioneer this concept. Three intentionally very different community Systems of Care were selected so that we could maximize the learning potential from that first nine-month pilot. Many of the same strategies in the initial pilot, from SAMHSA's co-investment with the systems of care to the technical support offered by Open Table and AIR, were built into that pilot design. And we have learned a great deal from the three initial pilots, including, number one, systems of care investment capital can effectively leverage additional community support to launch productive government faith community partnerships. Number two, local government and system cont contributions to provide seed funds, in-kind support, referral, and coordination can be successfully adapted for more traditional system of care work in the public sector to grow the capacity of the faith community in aligned partnership to the advantage of both partners. Number three, we know how to provide the right mix of universal, peer-to-peer, -peer, and intensive, individualized, and even on-site technical support to generate effective open table launches and capacity building at the community level. And number four, based on the diversity of the three original pilot sites, we have full confidence that open table support for people in poverty and transition can be viable in any community in every state. 
So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the director of one of the three original open table in systems of care pilots, Wardeen Talley, from the Saginaw Max System of Care in Saginaw, Michigan. Wardeen? Hi, Frank. Uh, thanks, and welcome everyone, newcomers and so forth. Um, I've had the honor and privilege of serving as director of Saginaw Max System of Care for the past five years. We're in year five of six of the original uh, cooperative agreement with SAMHSA. We recognized here in, Sa in Saginaw very early on that uh, a system, an entire system, was missing from the table. Uh, we had child welfare, juvenile justice, mental health, education, uh, the families and youth, but the faith community was a, a very critical link that was missing. Um, at that time, we convened a group of 30 pastors and their wives uh, for a, a retreat, and uh, we, we had the facilitator, everything coming together to help the faith community to understand how um, just critical their presence, the voice, and so forth. They have uh, tens of thousands of members uh, of families in, in their churches or synagogues or whatever on a weekly basis, and we needed to, to bring that voice, that presence to the table. And at the same time, we needed to be informed. We recognized that very early on. Uh, by uh, four from the faith community, uh, give us guidance and direction how best uh, to meet the needs of, of the children uh, that we were serving. Our uh, original the, uh, cooperative agreement uh, focused, the, the target group was children between the ages of 6 and 17 identified with severe emotional disturbance. These kids were being kicked out of school. We all know that school. Uh, recreation centers literally out of their homes and placed into foster care as, as a result of really big behaviors, uh, those challenges and that. Uh, but we realized they were also being kicked out of, and I'm using my pretend quotes, children's ministries. We just can't handle them. We don't have the training. We don't have the staff. So we came together. We had a three-day retreat, and, and we kind of thumb wrestled and sorted it all out. Uh, even some of the long-held uh, spiritual beliefs, for instance, spare the rod, spoil the child. If you are dealing with a child with severe emotional disturbance and you use a physical rod of correction or corporal punishment with, with all good intentions, it is in fact written in scripture, you will be abusing that child if you are somehow able to whip him into shape. And, and uh, the, the faith community had not considered that. We were, no, it is written. So we were able to, during that time, spare the rod, spoil the child. In our community, the LGTB, LGTBQ community, those young people were suffering. There's a relatively high rate of suicide nationwide, uh, bullying and so forth, low graduation rates because school is not a friendly place. Uh, but there is a scripture that says, mm, so we were able to bring these 30 pastors, very uh, high profile, if you will, uh, many of them senior pastors and leaders within this community, to come together and have a very courageous conversation. And at the end of those three days, we were able to uh, identify a need in our community for ongoing contact, communication, involvement, participation. <coughs> but we needed a model. We needed a framework, right, to uh, bring us together so that we weren't just meeting and talking, you know, and courageous conver conversations can go horribly awry if, if you don't have structure and, and you're headed in the same direction. So uh, Pastor Hurley Coleman, senior pastor in our community, we wound up attending one of the SAMHSA national conferences, um, and we found our model. We found, in, in my opinion, here in Saginaw, the only model that, that is, is for this season, it, it, it is for, for this time, this partnership, this marriage between uh, Open Table, uh, the faith community, uh, and government. So uh, here we are, a year or so down the road, and uh, the, the, these congregations have been uh, just open and receptive to, and there is an energy within this community that, that people are talking and what can I do? How can I get on board? How can I assist even if I'm not at a table? So 
it is just phenomenal, far beyond uh, what I expected, what, what the leadership here expected and, and growing uh, in, in regards to uh, trauma-informed community. And, and ours, Saginaw, has been on the, the top 10 most violent cities in the nation for 15 years, a very dubious distinction, but, but here we are. So a very traumatized community, resource parent training, which is uh, an evidence-based model, which will help to train uh, the, the faith community, the, the community at large, in recognizing, you know, big behaviors as a result of trauma and so forth. Well, with our 15 slots or spots for open table right now, 10 of them filled, uh, the faith community will guarantee 50 non duplicated, unduplicated bodies uh, once a month to participate in this eight-hour uh, trauma-informed, this resource parent training. It is phenomenal what is, is happening with this marriage, this relationship. And for, in, in terms of uh, return on investment, uh, you can't put a dollar amount on it. It is well worth the investment to groom your community, to, to bring these systems, including the faith community, to bring us together and effect change. So hopefully I haven't used every second that we had to share, and I'd like to hand off to Terry Coons, who is serving in just a phenomenal uh, uh, the leadership role with, with this initiative. Well, thanks, Wardeen. I think Wardeen is right on point. I'll, I'll be very brief in, in my additions to what she said. She's, she's right on the money. Um, the value, I think, for us in our community of Saginaw, Michigan, is largely measured in the establishment and the enrichment of relationships. And, and Wardeen already spoke very clearly um, about the relationship that's been established between the faith community and our system partners. And, and that, I don't think it can be overstated, just the growth and the development, the, um, you know, the respect, the mutual respect between pastors and the faith community and the partners within our system of care. And so I just want to emphasize that. But I'd also just like to maybe reference a couple of other relationships that have been built. Uh, congregations within our faith community. Um, we live in a city that's divided by a river. It's a geographic line, but that river is much more than just a line of geography. It can also be a, a metaphor for division within our community. And what we've seen because of Open Table is that we have churches involved in this, the 10 licensed congregations that we're referencing that historically have been divided uh, because of what side of the city they're on, because of ethnicity, because of the size of the congregations, because of their denomination, and because of Open Table, we have seen church unity here in Saginaw. Um, really, I think for the first time maybe in our history, uh, several of the pastors have commented that they have gotten to know other pastors, other, other ministries that um, they would have never uh, been able to be in contact with before, and they're developing relationships with each other. So that's definitely one key relation, relationship that we're very proud of and happy about. Uh, also, members of our congregations uh, individually are serving together in order to come in service to a brother or sister. And then we're just looking forward to really testimonies and stories from those in local congregations who, as they serve brothers and sisters through Open Table, will be able to report back to us about what they're experiencing. So we're measuring this in relationships. This is all about relationships, and we're just very excited to be partnering with Open Table. One of the things that we're doing as Saginaw Max System of Care is we are developing resources uh, to be able to be used by the congregations. Uh, something as simple as just uh, cards that we've developed that talk about our, our various um, system of care principles, things that are priorities to us in our teaching of system of care ideology. And so we're able to help to um, disseminate that information into our community by through our local congregations that are partnering in Open Table. Uh, this is definitely a win for everyone in the community. And they're welcome, to, anyone is welcome to, we, we will share you know, the, the cards that, that were created, uh, they help to reduce stigma. This relationship helps to reduce the stigma associated with 
those transition age youth, those, those kids with um, that, that, that the greatest need, the greatest challenges, those uh, big behaviors. So these cards, you're welcome to use them. Uh, put your name on it, remove the, the butterfly, um, use it. It will uh, help to build your community. And, and uh, another, very, very quickly, just those relationships that, and it's all about relationship for transformation, right? Well, those are relationships that long, long, I mean, many years from now, the faith community will still stand. Um, we're going to be here. The churches, the, these, the, the denominations, they're going to be here. And now to partner together like this, it enhances your ability to uh, receive resources and funding beyond uh, SAMHSA or, or, or any of, of what this, this, this system of care and what we're doing now. Those relationships are long standing and forever and our community is literally divided by a bridge. It has been since forever. Um, it's black-white. It, it is um, uh, poverty versus not. The, the schools, the, the further west you go, the better the school districts and, and that. So that divide, uh, we've crossed the bridge. We've literally crossed the bridge going both ways, right? So. Um, it's phenomenal, the transformation in this community. Uh, we recognized the need to do it, um, and, and we had 30 folks at the table, and, and that was great, but you need a framework to move forward. You need a model. You need something that everyone is honoring and respecting and speaking a common language, and that an open, t open table has provided that for this community. It is invaluable. Um, it is, it is well, well worth the investment. So call us anytime. We'll answer any questions. We'll, um, you know, whatever we can do to support and encourage, we're here. Thank you. Well, Dean, thank you very much for your testimony. And I just wanted to uh, add that I had the pleasure of being in Saginaw earlier this week and can personally confirm what uh, you were just sharing, Wardeen. There were in a group of 12 people who were working on sustainability planning for your system of care, that group included Pastor Ken, Pastor Hurley, and Pastor Chris. 25% of your planning team were representing the various faith congregations. So that investment, is, while we're talking today specifically about supporting the open table model, Saginaw presents an example of how that faith public partnership has blossomed in many directions in addition to nurturing the open table. So we hope that we've given you enough information to get excited about the possibilities here. We absolutely invite you to look at the materials that will be in your RFP packet, including this wonderful video that tells more of the Saginaw story, but similar testimony from Orange County, Florida, and Chautauqua County, New York. So here's what we have in mind. Through a competitive application process, three to five jurisdictions will be chosen for our second wave of open table system of care pilot. SAMHSA is supporting the pilot in ways that Gary talked about through enhanced training, manual development, and many other ways. If you are selected, you will be asked to pony up an 18-month investment of $50,000. So you'll want to uh, think about what you're hearing about return on investment, including the actual experience of the first three systems of care in that regard. Here's some of the support that you can expect to be provided by the Open Table organization in collaboration with AIR. These are some of the technical support functions that have been provided to the initial three pilot sites. And in many cases, we've learned a lot and our methods have actually been refined and improved to prepare to support you if you're in our second way of pioneers. In addition, uh, these are some additional ways that we will provide support, helping you with a capacity assessment so that we can know where best to target some of our technical uh, support between Open Table and AIR. We'll help you to develop long-term sustainability plan some of those tools that Wardeen was uh, describing, a few examples of, looking for new opportunities to expand your public-private partnerships, 
and as John was talking about, helping to develop a database to both show your progress in growing an effective local initiative, at the same time contributing to a growing body of national data to legitimize the process in the eyes of public systems. So here's what you need to do. Right after this webinar, any entity from a, part, a uh, funded system of care community can apply. Now, who's crazy enough to put out an RFP with a January completion date right before the holiday break? This is the easiest RFP you probably have seen. There are literally eight questions that you need to respond to. Not only that, we limit you to no more than six pages for your response. Did I mention that's double-spaced? Okay, you need to please give us your applications by January 15th, so you have a couple of weeks after New Year's, and then within 10 days we will be announcing the three to five system of care sites that have been awarded the opportunity to participate in the second wave. As soon as you get that word, you're going to start making some travel plans. We don't know yet whether you'll be going to Florida, Saginaw, Chautauqua County, New York, but one of those sites will be hosting the first orientation training where you bring your system of care and faith leader partners together. That was a very critical part in launching the effective pilot for the first three sites, and so we'll be replicating that training in March. So those are the basic steps that you'll need to follow. So remember, we're inviting you to join this national movement. If you're interested in applying, there's about four ways that you can do so. After this webinar, we're going to send that RFP packet to all participants in today's webinar. You'll also be able to click on the recording link. If there are people in your community that were unable to participate today, they'll be able to listen to the webinar recording, but when they click on that link, they'll be able to access the RFP materials right away. If that doesn't work for you, just send Sharon Hunt an email. You'll see her email address on this slide. Just tell her that you would like to apply. Please send me the application packet. And definitely be sure to look at the opentable.org website so that you can see story after story about how this process has helped to truly transform lives of young people and families for the better in many communities already around the nation. So we want to thank you for your attention. And I think we have a couple of minutes that we can uh, listen to see if you have any questions. We'd invite you to unmute your phone and to ask your questions. Your other option is to go ahead and type a question in the chat box, and someone on the team will try to respond to that. Sorry about we're not unmuting phones, so go ahead. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat box, please. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone typing yet. So the conclusion I'm going to draw is that our presentation team today has done at least a sufficient job of describing this opportunity to you. So we hope now that you'll take what you heard here, think about it, and ask for an RFP application packet. It's not going to take you a lot of work to submit an application. Like I say, if you can accomplish that by the January 15th deadline, then you'll be in the running to start having some of the same experience that Wardeen described to you from Saginaw, and that is also happening in Orlando, Florida, and rural western New York right now. So we hope that you will look favorably upon this opportunity, and we're going to welcome the opportunity to work with you. I see that uh, Mr. Greg Hill is typing, so let's see what Greg has to say or ask. Okay, so uh, Melinda is asking a question about tips for buy-in for this $50,000 investment for system of care 
members. So, of course, you do have, you know, uh, your SAMHSA grant funding and your matching fund strategies that are available. In addition, in many communities, there are private sources that have been leveraged to support the community investment from both business and from phil philanthropic sources. And members of our technical support team have actually been helping some of the communities to identify those possibilities. I want to ask if any other members of the team would like to respond to Melinda's question. Any tips? So Melinda, I would just uh, you know, ask you to think about the um, referral organizations. You may have a population in mind that has been, you know, seems like it could particularly benefit from this kind of support. Let's just imagine, for example, young people who are getting ready to leave the foster care system for adult living. And so that might indicate that child welfare systems would have a motivation to invest in this ongoing kind of support. Independent living services and programs might be another place to look on behalf of that population. So I think some of the answer to your question will also be driven by particular members of your community for whom you think that Open Table has some particular promise. Anything else? Well, again, I want to thank you guys for setting aside time in a busy week, especially on a Friday afternoon. So uh, if you do have any remaining questions, please feel free to reach out to Sharon Hunt and to John Katov. You saw their email addresses on the uh, slide in front of you. Thank you, and have a uh, wonderful rest of the day, a happy weekend, and a great uh, holiday season. Thanks very much.